heparin, nitro, potassium, and unfamiliar drugs. So heparin indications, uh, MI or acute coronary syndrome. You can also give it for DVT or pulmonary embolism. Give it for stroke or TIA. And how do we know if you're going to have a stroke versus just you're having a TIA? We don't know. Same thing, right? Maybe it'll get better, maybe it won't. You clear within 24 hours, it was a TIA. You don't clear, it's a stroke. Arterial occlusion. So I don't know why, but we've seen a rash of these lately uh, at St. Pat's where uh, we have these folks that have really bad arterial vasculature and they'll develop a clot and they'll come in with a cold extremity. Or uh, we had a case recently with a, a cold lower half. <laughs> the clot was in the aorta, which was impressive. Uh, and then uh, venous thrombolism, thromboembolism prophylaxis. Anybody want to explain that? So you're in bed, you're sick, you're not moving around, uh, your body is under some stress, you're more likely to have a clot. So we put you on heparin at a low dose just so that you don't form a clot that then breaks off and goes to your lung. By the way, pulmonary embolism is considered one of the leading preventable causes of death for a hospitalized patient. And the reason for that is we have good prophylaxis. If we give you medications either subcutaneously or in rare cases intravenously, then we can prevent you from forming that DVT. And if you don't get a DVT, it's not gonna bust off and go to your lung. And if it doesn't go to your lung, it won't kill you. So good to prevent that. Um, I would say that that's the least common for EMS, for interfacility transport, that you'd be doing heparin just for DVT prophylaxis, but it's there. Questions about any of those indications? And that's all heparin. Okay, mechanism of action. Don't worry about reading that. You can read it later if you care. Uh, basically, it acts by indirectly binding to antithrombin is the easiest way to say that. Or another way to think about that is there's that huge clotting cascade that you might remember from school. And what heparin does is it goes in there and interrupts one of the ability, or one of the, the progressions of that pathway. All right, so it prevents clots from getting bigger. It makes it harder for you to form new clots or to expand the size of existing clots. All right, so that's really what to know about what heparin but does. It does not dissolve. Does not dissolve. Okay. Does it have any effect on existing? This is a lot of Correct, yeah. So the body takes up to 28 days to break down an existing clot, and all that heparin is doing is making sure that clot doesn't get any bigger. It's not going to make that clot smaller. So, okay. yeah. And that is an important distinction between heparin and uh, some of your thrombolytics, like say TNKs, which you might give for uh, an MI where you don't have a cath lab, or uh, TPA, uh, which is mostly used for stroke. Uh, TPA can also be used for uh, pulmonary embolism. Right. And uh, heparin is not going to dissolve those clots. All it does is prevent them from getting worse. All right. If you have uh, a narrowing or a buildup of red cells in your coronary artery that's causing you to have ischemia and you're having a heart attack, it does not reopen those vessels. All it does is prevent the occlusion from getting worse. Okay. So the metabolism of heparin is uh, through the liver and then it's excreted in the urine, all right? Uh, renal dosing does occasionally exist where we would have to adjust the dose, but by and large, even people with impaired kidney function um, can be started on heparin. So the pharmacists have these protocols that they use to decide how much heparin they're going to give you. And they may make an adjustment based on kidney function, but it's not generally something that you need to worry about individually. The onset of heparin and the intravenous route is virtually instantaneous. So that's really nice. If you come in with a pulmonary embolism, I want you to get your heparin just as soon as possible. One minute is one minute longer that that clot is getting bigger. So the sooner the better, all right? And I want you to get that in the intravenous route because it's gonna go systemic almost immediately and it's gonna prevent that clot from getting any larger for you, all right? Um, subcutaneous would be much more commonly like what Christy would use on 4South for DVT prophylaxis, okay? It's uh, usually a dose that's given once every 12 hours, sometimes every 24, 
and it's given into the fat, and we all know that fat is not terribly well perfused, so eventually it's gonna build up and get into the circulation, but it's not gonna happen right away. So for our purposes in emergency transport and intervention, almost all heparin is gonna be given intravenously because we're trying to address a clot that's here today, right now, and I want it to not get any bigger right now. So, yeah. Can I ask a quick question that may show ignorance, but um, heparin does not dissolve, break down, it's not thrombolytic. Why are we not giving thrombolytics more for like a PE or, or MI or something that you would want to? Great with, question, right? yeah. So thrombolytics are Drano, basically. Okay. Uh, so Drano, if you talk to a plumber, is really hard on your plumbing. Uh, if you put Drano down your drain repeatedly, it'll eventually eat up your plumbing. Okay. And uh, when a clot is against a vessel, against the intimal wall, it actually uh, causes breakdown and damage of the vessel wall. So in the process of pouring Drano down into that vessel to break up the clot, which is good, um, you're also putting that very caustic medication against that weakened wall where the clot was, and it's not hard to imagine what happens next. And now you have a patient that doesn't clot very well because they were on heparin and now they've had this really aggressive clot-busting medication, and now you have a ruptured vessel. That's bad. Yeah. So heparin causes bleeding. That's one of the big side effects. Mm -hmm. But the incidence of bleeding on heparin if uh, the dose is done correctly, very low. The incidence of bleeding is substantially higher for thrombolytics. So then you get into this discussion of risk benefit, okay? Mm -hmm. So for pulmonary embolism, if you have a tiny little pulmonary embolism that we had to squint to see on the CT scan, and we put you on heparin, it's probably not gonna get any worse, okay? And the benefit of putting some Drano into you and potentially giving you a bunch of bleeding, maybe in your brain or maybe at the source of the, source of the clot, is not so good, right? Yeah. So the risk benefit isn't there. If, however, you come in and you have right heart strain because your heart can't push the blood from the right side to the left side across that pulmonary embolism, your blood pressure is you know, 70 over 30, you're on a vasopressor, your pulse rate's through the roof, your lung is dying because the lung tissue itself gets, uh, doesn't have blood supply from a PE, yeah, I'm gonna give you that thrombolytic, you bet. It's just that question of risk benefit. Yeah, good question. Um, so, onset of heparin, intravenous, almost instantaneous. So, for emergency purposes, the question is always, are we giving you IV? Good? Yeah. All right. If you're seeing sub-Q heparin, ask some questions. Adverse reactions for heparin, speaking of which, bleeding, including severe bleeding and life-threatening bleeding. All right? So, what we really don't want to do is have somebody on heparin crawl out of bed and fall down and hit their head. All right? because they can't form clots. So what might have been a little subdural to you turns into a huge subdural for them, all right? So uh, bleeding is the biggest problem. And it's a problem if you can't form clots and then you sustain a trauma, right? That's what we know about people that are on Coumadin or some, any of these other uh, medications that prevent you from forming clots, right? Heparin acts in a different way on the clotting cascade, but the effect is the same. You can't form clots, good and bad, right? Um, and then, of course, we have the um, dosing mistakes with heparin, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, blood from two or more sources is a sign that you have uh, super therapeutic levels, uh, and you need to address that, okay? So if you have a patient who has bleeding from two different places that they shouldn't have been bleeding from, you're going to turn off that heparin. You don't have to wait. You don't have to call med control. Turn it off. Make a call after that, right? But turn it off. And the reason for that is if they're bleeding from two sites, uh, you're strongly suspicious that they, their heparin levels are too high. Maybe that's because of a medication error. Maybe that's just because they're especially sensitive to it. Some patients react differently than others. Um, but the bottom line is we don't want to give a patient who's bleeding from two sources any more heparin because they're already uh, too thin as it is. All right. So the sources that you might see, hemoptysis, all right, or coughing up blood, vomitus, and it can be hard to tell, are they coughing it up or are they puking it up, right? Um, in the stools, so if you start seeing black sticky stools or especially bright red stools, hopefully that's less likely. Um, in the urine, okay, so if they've got a foley in and initially the, the foley was clear yellow and suddenly you look down and it's got a pinkish hue to it, that's a problem. 
uh, bleeding from the gums, bleeding from puncture sites, including around your IVs, you'll see them oozing sometimes, and uh, epistaxis, that's another common location. So if you see bleeding from two or more sources, um, then I would urge you to think that the patient is super therapeutic and you need to turn the heparin off, all right? There are lab tests to corroborate that, which is what we would do next in the hospital setting, but of course we don't have access to those in the back of the ambulance. But the other reason that you're probably pretty safe to turn off heparin if they're bleeding from two sites, if they're bleeding from two sites, they're super thin. They're probably not going to clot real quick, right? Um, so that would be an indication that you've got an adverse reaction. High-risk medication because of the med errors. So heparin is dosed in small units, and unfortunately, it's one of those drugs that has a very narrow therapeutic window. So I start you on a certain amount of heparin, and then in an interval, usually about six hours, we'll do some tests to see if your blood is as thin as we thought it would be. And not uncommonly, we find that the blood is still a little too thick. So then the pharmacist will call the nurse and they'll say, we need you to increase the rate and we want you to give a little bolus, okay? And what we're doing is trying to get you up to that point where your blood is thin enough that you're not gonna extend that clot anymore. So in the interim, your clot wasn't getting as big as it would have with no heparin, but it was still growing a little, okay? So people can still extend their clots or get clinically worse even on heparin, right? If the heparin's not therapeutic. Now, the other risk is if we give just a little too much heparin, then we have inappropriate bleeding all over the place. And the difference is like by units of 10, right? So there have been some very high profile deaths associated with heparin in hospital settings because people think they're giving 100 units and they give 1,000 units. Or they think they're giving 5,000 and they give 50,000 units, okay? Heparin has a lot of different concentrations. And especially in pediatric patients, it's possible to give a very reasonable adult dose and put a kid into a situation where they're gonna have inappropriate bleeding from everywhere. And when you bleed into your brain, we all know what happens to head bleeds on thinners. It doesn't go well, right? So um, high risk medication. So what does that mean? In the hospital setting, we use two separate people to double check the dose of heparin before we administer it. And the reason we do that is because if we mess this up, the impact can be rather serious. And we'll get to what you can do as a pre-hospital provider in just a minute. So heparin dosing is gonna be partially impacted on the goals of care. Uh, typically, there's gonna be a bolus of about 60 to 80 units per kilo, and there's usually a max of 4,000 units total for an adult patient. You may see a max up to 5,000, and I would say the absolute hard limit would be 10,000. You should never see more than that. Uh, in rare cases with the pulmonary embolism, you might see a doubling of the dose, which is how I got to that 10,000 unit, but 10,000 would be really uncommon. Four to 5,000 is typically the cap. And some of this depends on local protocol. Uh, I did some Googling and, uh, to prepare for this tonight, and uh, multiple protocols across multiple hospitals in different parts of the country uh, ranged from four to 5,000 as the, the normal cap for, um, for MIs, for ACS. And um, the continuous infusions are weight-based as well. And they're typically about 1,000 units an hour, again, maybe up to doubling for a pulmonary embolism. I saw some protocols where pulmonary embolism infusions might be as high as 1850 or even 2,000 units an hour. Uh, the reason that you do that max dose as well is uh, with people who are obese. Uh, we don't want to give extra heparin for fat because fat doesn't metabolize extra heparin, right? So if you're a normal person trapped in a fat body, you don't want to give fat body heparin, you wanna give normal person heparin, all right? So uh, there, there are limits on the amount that we'll give regardless of your weight. So dosing is controversial and a little bit variable, but it is weight-based with a fixed limit. Any questions about that? Okay, um, the way that a doctor will order heparin is pharmacy to dose heparin, period. Put it into the computer and that's the end of it, right? We could do the calculation, it used to be on the sheets and the nurses would do it and we just have two nurses. It's you know definitely within our ability to do it um, on the interfacility transport, but pharmacy typically handles all that stuff for us. And that's an extra person in the cross check to make sure that we're not issuing too much heparin so that it can then be given by somebody who's not paying attention. So um, typically pharmacy doses it, 
they'll call the provider, a nurse, maybe you, and they'll say, we're gonna have you give a 4,000 unit bolus and then hang a drip at 1,000 units an hour. That would be like the most common order in the world, 4,000 and then 1,000 an hour, okay? Um, boluses can be repeated during the infusion. So this would be less common, but let's say you show up to transfer a patient who has a pulmonary embolism and they decide to draw some lab work before the patient departs the facility, okay? They, think they get the, the lab work back and they realize that they're a little subtherapeutic. They need a little bit more heparin. They don't want to just increase the infusion rate because that's going to take another couple of hours for the patient to catch up. They want it to be done right now. So what they would do is they'd call and they say, we want you to give a little, a little bolus and then we're going to have you turn up the rate. And the purpose of the bolus is to get them therapeutic immediately. And then the increase in the rate is so that they maintain at that, um, that level of heparin. Okay, so that their blood stays thin. Yes? Uh, I caught the onset of action, which was immediate. Mm -hmm. The duration of action. If we stop it, how long? I mean, if they're bleeding from two sources, we stop it. Are you looking at hours? Or? Um, thankfully, the, the um, heparin is metabolized fairly quickly in the IV form. So it's gonna, it's gonna drop pretty quickly. Okay. Now, if you've made a mistake on the order of giving 100 mm -hmm. times more heparin than you were supposed to, or they did, uh, you know, it's still going to take a while for that all to get metabolized, but typically it's fairly fast on, fast off. Okay, and that does have implications too, because if you lose your IV access or something, then you know, they, they no longer have that thinning that you were hoping for. Yeah, so fast on, fast off. Uh, typically, I would say, you know, you're going to see that change in 30 to 60 minutes. We could see it change in the lab work. So yeah, and I'm just shooting from the hip on that, but. So some sample calculations. Desired dose is a 1,000 units per hour continuous after the bolus, all right? So 1,000 units per hour and the most common concentration is 50 units per mil. So 50 unit per mil bag, and you want to give 1,000 units an hour, it, that works out to 20 milliliters an hour of a 50 unit per mil bag, okay? So you would anticipate that on your pump, you would see 20 mils per hour. Now on the pump, you can tell it, I have a bag of heparin, and that bag of heparin is 50 units per mil, and you can tell the pump, I want to give Bob 1,000 units an hour, and the pump will do the math for you. The pump will independently say, based on the concentration and the desired units per hour, the pump knows it's 20 mils per hour. Now one of the double checks that you can do to make sure that you've programmed the pump correctly is to already have that math, do it on a piece of paper or in your head, however, if you're that kind of person, but anticipate that you're gonna see 20 units an hour. Then you're gonna have a second person do the math and then check your pump, all right? But if you enter the wrong information into the pump, you're holding a 50 unit bag, or let's say you're holding a 100 unit bag, but you enter 50 in the pump, what's the pump gonna do? It doesn't know any better. It only knows what you told it. So if you're holding a 100 unit bag and you told it it was 50, the pump's gonna double dose poor Bob there because you got the concentration wrong. And you look at it and it looks perfectly fine, but you hung the wrong concentration, so you're giving twice as much heparin as you meant to give, all right? Now remember I told you, it's a very therapeutic window, so Bob may experience some inappropriate bleeding um, during the transport, so that's not good. All right, so concentration is really important and that's the biggest pitfall with heparin. Um, if you were going to do 1,200 units per hour at 50 units per mil, 24 mils, all right? So really, you should never see more than 30 um, mils an hour. If you're more than 30, there's a problem. This, the two most common concentrations of heparin you'll see in this region are 50 units a mil and 100 units a mil, uh, with 50 being the more, more likely one. So if you ever see a heparin infusion going faster than 30 mils an hour, Forget all the units and the math and all that stuff. If you're over 30 unit mils an hour, ask a lot of questions, all right? Something is probably wrong with that infusion. I'm not saying it's impossible, just ask a lot of questions. Um, and really 20 would be what I would anticipate, all right? But again, is 20 safe if you hang 100 units per mil? No, it's not. 10, 10 would have been the answer, right? So. Just because you've got the right mils an hour on your pump does not make it safe. You do need to still double check your concentration. And if you're the second person double checking heparin for somebody, the concentration actually looking at the bag is an integral part of that double check. All right, so the max dose you should ever see, 30, 30 mils an hour. 
If you ever see it more than 30, um, ask a lot of questions. All right. So heparin, bolus maximums. It's typically going to be 5,000 units IV. You may see four, uh, depending on the situation. And again, with pulmonary embolism, some protocols will go up to a doubling. So 10 would be like the outside top amount. You should challenge any order that asks for more than 5,000 units. Anytime you're giving more than 5,000, you should say to whoever's telling you to do it, I just want to make sure I understand this and what's the rationale. All right? And um, in heparin, they have the different concentrations for the boluses by different colors. Now, that doesn't mean you should just look and say, oh, it's the orange one, it's safe, right? Read the rest of it. But they've had so many problems with heparin that they've gone and tried to make it nurse proof by making the, t the brown ones are 10,000 and the orange ones are 5,000 and the porcine heparin is yellow and whatever else it is because they're trying to get my brain to see the right thing and not grab the 10,000 unit one when I meant for the 5,000. So um, they're typically orange. Now, all three of these um, vials and that little pre-filled syringe, they're all heparin, but notice how different they look. All right. So just like all of our other medications, um, they can they can look a lot of different ways, and they can be supplied in different containers. So you want to use two people to calculate the dose and to confirm rates. When you're double checking your concentration, remember that it's not universal. Always, always with heparin, you must use a pump. If your pump is not functioning, if you can't figure out how to get it to work, you are not infusing heparin. Period. Uh, heparin is just simply not something that's safe to be given free flow, uh, even by like the micro drip set or any of that stuff. So pump or no go. Monitor for abnormal bleeding from two sources. Be extra careful to prevent falls and do what's called bleeding precautions. Okay. If you don't have to start another IV, don't, um, and make sure that you're assisting the patient when they're transferring. Okay. If there's any question uh, about a patient's safety during standing and pivoting from the gurney to the bed, especially if they're on heparin, I would think more about doing a draw sheet just to reduce the risk of a fall. Okay? Um, and heparin is frequently compatible with nitroglycerin. Why would I mention that? Lots of patients who are on heparin are also on nitroglycerin, and you may only have one IV to work with. So when I say frequently, what does that mean? Well, there's different formulations of both heparin and nitroglycerin, so I can't tell you universally every brand you'll ever encounter is going to be, going to be compatible. But by and large, heparin and nitro run together and they play together okay. Um, so you yeah. should... Is that enough of an issue in compatibility that you need all the pharmacists on all these? This is these are the two or is this theoretical? I think with these two in particular, you're probably okay. Um, Certain medications like uh, Zosin, the antibiotic, really uncooperative with almost anything else you could put it with. So you're just not going to run Zosin with another thing. Um, heparin nitro, usually compatible, usually good. So. so these are some product labels for heparin. And this gets me back to, is it compatible or is it not? Heparin can be diluted in different things. On the left, you'll see that the, it, there's heparin in D5. <laughs> And on the right, you'll see that there's heparin in, in half NS, okay? Um, so those are two different different medications um, because of what it's diluted in, all right? Even though you're giving heparin. And then if you look, there's all these different colors, right? And in the bottom, you may not be able to see it terribly well, but this says 50 units per mil, and then this says 100 units per mil, okay? Remember I said those are the two most common uh, concentrations. And then here, again, 50 and 100, and the difference is whether it's in dextrose uh, and also the total volume. If you look in the upper left, it says 500 milliliters, so that's a bigger bag. And on the lower right, you'll see it's in 250 milliliters, so that's a different bag, okay? So uh, four different versions of heparin that you could run into at some critical access hospital. And you may be very familiar with the heparin coming out of Ronan, because maybe you do a lot of transports out of there, but then you go down to Superior, and you're going to run into a completely different color and dilution of heparin, right? And that's why it's so important to make sure that you uh, double check your concentrations. All right, this is another very common uh, illustration of heparin, and this is the half NS, and this happens to be 100 units per mil. So if you're doing 20 mils an hour of 100 units per mil, what, uh, how many units an hour are you giving? 
2,000 units an hour instead of 1,000, okay? So uh, the concentration really matters, all right? You can't just go by mils an hour or you'll get yourself into trouble. And garbage in, garbage out as far as the pump is concerned. If you tell the pump the wrong concentration, it doesn't know any better, okay? So here's the scenario. 70-year-old female with a submassive PE, and submassive just means it's not providing right heart strain. There's probably no hypotension associated with it. It's not gonna kill her right now. Uh, has shortness of breath and a cough. Those are common with pulmonary embolism. So she is located at an outside hospital two and a half hours away. I made you drive a little further tonight. The vitals are 120 over 80. You know, any, anyone really believe that vital? No, okay. It's made up, right? 120 over 80, pulse 103 in sinus, and respirators are 17. Interventions where she had a CT scan to diagnose the submassive PE. She got 10,000 units of heparin and 1,500 units per hour infusion, okay? And when you get there, the nurse reports that while they were bolusing the heparin, the IV infiltrated, it went bad. So um, they gave it sub Q while they were starting a second IV. They repeated the dose, all right? They called pharmacy, they got another one, they gave it sub Q. Uh, and then they subsequently were able to get another IV started for you before your transport, okay? Any questions about any of this? During the transport, the patient develops epistaxis. So you do a reassessment, because Marcus told you to do that during the last discussion, right? So you reassess and you find that the patient is coughing and appears to be expectorating bloody sputum, all right? So she's also complaining of a headache. She says it's really bad. I can't pick a number, but wow, right? Okay, so what are you gonna do first? Turn off the heparin, okay? Why? Because she's got inappropriate bleeding from two sources. Where's the second source? Possibly. Maybe the brain, right? So headache, severe headache in a patient on heparin, turn it off, all right? Um, maybe even with that being the only thing, or at least call med control, because you're concerned that you have intracranial hemorrhage, okay? But certainly she has multiple sites that are bleeding, and this is inappropriate. What else are you going to do? Okay, so you could, you could do some direct control pressure for that, okay, and what, what else? Some yeah, so you, you'd want to let somebody know that they gave some sub-Q. What's the implication of the sub-Q? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you got some delayed onset, right? So that's not really something you can shut off if it's already in there. Um, what else are you going to do? Reassess her neurology. Yeah, so assess neurofunction because now you're concerned about intracranial hemorrhage. Blood pressure. Blood pressure is good. Maybe she's going to have bleeding from another site. Start another IV. Yeah, start another IV. Might get a little oozy. Because you said she lost her. Yeah, they, they started a second line in the facility. Yeah. Yep. What's that? I thought that was against like, the full like, the bleeding, bleeding precautions. Yeah, it's a relative contraindication. Yeah. I mean, if they're exsanguinating, you're going to put another line in, right? Um, how many of you would call online med control? Yeah, okay. Um, the antidote for heparin overdose is protamine. You don't have any protamine in the ambulance, but it'd be nice that they'd be evaluated and maybe get that earlier rather than later if that is indeed what's going on, okay? Plus, maybe there, you know, what else does she maybe need once she gets to the receiving facility? CT. CT head, right? All right, good. So if you stop the drip, the patient arrived with a small head bleed and got discharged on day five with no major deficits, okay? If you continued the drip, the patient developed a severe head bleed and required discharge to a skilled nursing facility, right? And who did you call and what did you say? Okay, so we, we called online med control and we told them we turned off the heparin, she has a bad headache, I'm concerned. She's got bleeding from multiple sources and I have some questions about the heparin. Would you ever deviate from your transport? I mean, let's say we're going from here to Spokane, your patient deteriorates, you're passing superior. They've got an ED. I know yeah. it's not much of one. That is a great. That is a great. Would you ever deviate to stabilize the patient before? That's a great question. Um, that case that I was discussing earlier at that other place that I worked long ago that had that fatality on an inner facility, they deviated to a critical access hospital. I think that was a good decision on their part because um, that patient was in full arrest and you're not going to like continue driving past a hospital. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, you know, that's an option. I don't know that I would drive like out of my way. I, I think I'd rather do that with the blessing of somebody, maybe the sending physician or, or the receiving. I'd like to get med control involved in that decision. Yeah. Um, there, I, I am aware of cases in this area where flight has rendezvoused with uh, ground transport halfway through because they weren't doing well. Um, so, you know, to the extent that that's an option, uh, you know, something else to think about, uh, shorten up the transport time. Uh, yeah, I think all of those things are on the table. Yeah. Um, I'm aware of cases where people have gone back to the sending facility. I think that's a really, that's a tr tough judgment call based on how recently you've left. You know, like, don't, if you're halfway, go the other way, right? Um, and then also, you know, the sending facility may not have a definitive intervention for this patient, which is why they're being transferred. So it just comes down to like, what what are you achieving? You know? um, if you're 10 minutes away and that's a two hour drive and suddenly that trauma patient that Dave had on all that Levofed is crumpy, you know, yeah, I'd rather go back and get some blood because I'm not gonna make another hour and 50 minute drive, you know, in these conditions. That's a very tough call and very situational. But yeah, it's on the table, yeah. It's not even discussed, I just said that for a second. But when you're bolusing, because we're allowed to initiate heparin, right? That was part of our protocol. Uh, heparin initiation. I think mostly they're going to have you maintaining it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but like, is it that bolus in like a little size bag or not just a push, I'm guessing? Um, the bolus is typically in a vial and it, it would be um, out of just the vial and then you hang the bag, which is a totally different concentration. So you would just IV push that bolus? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. It's over a minute, two minutes. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Good question. So what uh, happened with this patient? Like, why did they get into all this trouble? Probably had to do with the Q. Yeah. And then giving it again. In the yeah. IV. So if you infiltrate heparin, I've had this happen a few times, the IV line will go bad. So it's now not going into the vasculature, right? So pharmacy goes, uh-oh, your, your levels are low. We need to give another bolus, right? And so we're like, oh, maybe the IV's bad. So we start a new IV and we give a bolus. But what happens to the heparin that wasn't going in the vein for the last six hours, right? It's, it's, it's still in the sub-Q. It's still going to be absorbed, right? So six hours later, we've given a bolus, and now we're also absorbing the sub-Q, and now we're super therapeutic. Um, I've seen multiple patients where this has occurred. So the fact that the line failed, you know, that that bolus that she was getting went into the patient somewhere, right? And then eventually got absorbed. Mm -hmm. And then she was thinking, oh, it didn't go in. Like how often, you've had this happen. You've got an IV and you go to push something and it's like, ah, now the IV's not flushing so well. Maybe, it, you know, maybe they didn't get it. So I'm gonna give it again. And then the other complication with this patient is they're on a really, really high dose. It's 10,000 units, right? Which is much more because they're a pulmonary embolism. So that's a higher risk for bleeding anyway, and then now they've got the sub Q plus they got repeated with the IV route. Okay, so if ever you were going to have a complication, it would be with this patient. Right, so uh, just kind of something to be aware of. All right, nitroglycerin uh, indication. You're already familiar with this, so we're going to gloss over this. I'm just going to talk a little bit about IV specific stuff. So it's indicated for MI and acute coronary syndrome, and there may be some role for it in a uh, heart failure patient uh, who's in respiratory distress, uh, depending on which position you listen to. So hypertensive heart failure. So a mechanism of action, you already know this, it dilates, dilates the large coronary arteries and arterioles, it dilates the venous system to decrease the preload, and it does provide a little bit of systemic arterial dilation. And uh, it may be effective in terminating angina. Okay? And it does enhance collateral blood flow for the heart. So the parts of the heart that are flowing well, it, it makes those flow better. Okay? So nitrates produce these effects by entering the va uh, vascular smooth muscle. Um, and the rest of that is for people who like to geek out on pharmacy. All right, so contraindications, just like the pill form, um, the systolic blood pressure needs to be greater than 90 or 100, depending on what text you read, but I would say at least 90. Uh, if their pressure is in the 80s, systolic, we're not going to be given any nitro. They need to uh, 
They can develop to mark to bradycardia, so you want to be on the lookout for that. If they're super bradycardic, uh, that might be another reason not to give nitro. If they have a known right ventricular infarct, what EKG findings are consistent with a right ventricular infarct? Jeff and Trent, you don't get to answer those. 2-3 ABF, okay. All right, so if you have elevation in 2-3 ABF, you suspect a, a RCA infarct, you don't want to be giving nitro, or if you do, very cautiously, okay? And why is that again? Because you're decreasing the preload. So the right ventricle is very dependent on preload. If it's not squeezing very well, it needs to be filled fully so that it can eject. When you decrease that preload with the nitroglycerin, suddenly there's, there's not good squeeze out of the right side of the heart. Okay. So you're going to have a marked drop in blood pressure. And um, severe aortic stenosis. So that is a condition where uh, the aortic valve um, is restricted. And so the heart is basically trying to pump through a straw. All right. So if you decrease the preload and decrease the amount of pressure that the heart is pumping uh, through that stenosed aorta, uh, then you're going to have problems, okay, because you're decreasing the pressure. Um, you're probably not going to know they have severe aortic stenosis. Uh, by the way, though, those are frequently those patients that you give nitro and they have that big drop in blood pressure. They probably they could have a little aortic stenosis. But you may not know that, but it's good to, good to talk about. Is, can you go back to that? Yeah. Even just from a ELS version of this. The, so you, the bradycardia is because it can cause further bradycardia or is it uh, why is yeah so this is just again? this is just from up to date and up to date okay. is um, all of their pharmacy stuff comes from um, Lexicomp and Lexicomp is considered one of the gold standards for you know pharmacy reference um, and I think what they're getting at here is if a patient's cardiac output is low because their heart rate is low, they may not be able to compensate because of the decrease in preload and the dilation of the arterial system as well. Yeah. Some of it is because so the right coronary artery perfuses like 56% of the SA node up to 90% of the AV node, which controls that bradycardic component. So then you increase your nitro, which causes increased bradycardic. Yeah, remembering that cardiac output is stroke volume plus or times heart rate, okay? So if they already have low heart rate and now you decrease the stroke volume by giving them nitroglycerin, you're hitting them on both sides of that equation and what's gonna happen? Their cardiac output's gonna drop. I think that's what they're getting at. So how about the tachycardia then? Um, are you seeing that as a contraindication? Or tachycardia or radiation? says anything over 100, you should give nitro, so I don't know that I agree. They said, they yeah, and the EMT even textbook says that now. So I was just says don't give it if it's over. Correct. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It's a so, compensatory thing from the tachycardia, I believe. But so I, I copied this directly out of up to date, and that's that's what they're you know that's out of Lexicomp, and uh, I'm hearing that you know that's the EHA guideline too. So take that for what you will. The other thing I'm going to say about all this is. Uh, what you give um, in the pill form is a lot larger and more aggressive than what you would give in, a in an infusion form. So if you're gonna get a complication, it's almost always gonna be with the pill form. The infusion form uh, is much lower incidence of complications. And we'll get to the math on that in a second. So like even for like a, a known right ventricular infarct, if they're still having pain, in the ER we will sometimes start like three mics or two mics of nitro, which is like a piddly little dose, but we're giving so much less than you would give in a pill form in a pre-hospital setting that we can get away with it. And we're going to see a minute change as opposed to a big hammer. So, so, um, so drip rate, yeah. Can we clarify that real quick? So I always thought we gave nitro to open everything up to ease the flow, right? Mm -hmm. Pass what everybody needs to lock it. But somebody said it really has nothing to do with that. It's all about pain. It's actually a pain reliever to that. And that's why we give nitro for heart. It, but is that right or no? Well, it seems counterintuitive. My my understanding at my level is if a patient is having pain, that's indicative of ischemia, and ischemia suggests that there are heart cells not getting the oxygen that they want. 
Okay. That's damaging the heart. So in the hospital setting with a non-STEMI, we say that they only need a heart catheterization within 24 hours, as long as they're not having pain. If they're having pain, then we become concerned that heart cells are actively dying, and then we need to reorder the priorities and do something different. So my thinking is, if you give nitro to somebody and they're not having pain, then it's relieved the strain on the muscle. And that whole thing when in STEMI land, where they say time is muscle, you know, if you can get away and make that person pain-free, then they're having less damage to their heart, is the theory. Okay. I have to tell you that um, there's a really cool uh, list of interventions and their effects called Number Needed to Treat. And if you give 10 patients aspirin, one of them will survive their heart attack because of the aspirin you gave. Aspirin improves the mortality rate 10%. So that's, that's amazing. Right? The number needed to treat for nitroglycerin, I don't know it off the top of my head, but it may be infinite, right? Like, I don't know that there's actual proof that administration of nitroglycerin um, changes mortality rates, okay? It might improve outcomes, like you might wind up with less heart failure, <laughs> um, but it's, it, the number needed to treat is definitely a lot higher than something like aspirin. And that's why in my personal practice, if I suspect that somebody is having an MI, even a low threshold, I have a pretty low threshold for giving aspirin. I sometimes will give aspirin and then not nitroglycerin, just because nitro to me is, is less important in the algorithm, but I know aspirin makes a difference. Some of these are just my opinions. Um, all right, so drip rate uh, for transport. <clears throat> this is out of the state protocol. If the patient has chest pain present, you can increase the nitroglycerin uh, drip by five mites per minute. So if they started on five, you'd go to 10. If they were on 10, you'd go to 15. Um, every five minutes, you're gonna reassess the patient. So just like your pill form of nitro, you're gonna say, what's your pain number? If they're still having pain, you're gonna increase the nitroglycerin. The goal is that they be pain free. And don't let patients lie to you. I tell them all the time, like, don't minimize. If you're having pain, it means your heart's under stress. I don't want that. So I want you pain-free, zero out of 10. And they'll say, well, I have a little. Okay, so that's not zero, all right? Um, we want them at zero. So keep going until you get to zero. And every five minutes, you're gonna go up until the systolic is below 100, okay? And if you're on more than uh, if, you, if you've increased by more than 10, then they want you to contact med control. This is straight out of the state protocol. I will tell you that the standard dosing for nitroglycerin is 5 to 250 in the computer. That's the standard order entry um, in EPIC. Okay? Mm -hmm. I have never encountered a patient that went past 50, and they went from not well to doing just great. Okay? For two reasons. First of all, it's people that need more than 50 uh, continuous, uh, they've got a big lesion, they've got a big problem. It's not gonna get better with just nitroglycerin in most cases. The second reason they're not okay is because at that dose, they almost always have just a blinding headache, which by itself is so terrible that they're begging you to turn it back down. So realistically, the doses we see are anywhere from five to 15. Um, it's rare to see effects after 20, okay? Now, let's say you're at 10 and they're having chest pain. So you go to 20 and they're still having chest pain. They've had no change. It's still 7 out of 10. Might not be their heart, right? Sometimes we put people on like a lot of nitroglycerin and it never gets better. And that's a cue to us that there's something else going on besides just ACS, okay? So um, the state wants you to reach out to med control if you increase the rate by more than 10, all right? So if they started on five, you increased it by 10, you're at 15, before you go to 20, they want you to make a phone call, which is pretty reasonable because if you get past 15, you know, this is probably a pretty sick person, right? It's rare for doses to be more than 30, but 250 is the established maximum. Um, headaches are the most common complication, just like the pill form that you give, and you would consider morphine to reduce pain uh, uh, Either, either for the headache or, you know, that can be an adjunct for, for cardiac stuff too. Morphine's kind of out of favor these days. We don't give it as often for that Mona like we used to, but it is still an option. Uh, the good news about nitro drip is it's fast on, fast off, right? As soon as you turn it off within a minute or two, you're already, you know, the effects are clearing. 
Okay, so unlike the pill where you're giving this huge dose and it's like, well, I hope this works in the next five minutes, um, and I hope they tolerate it well, uh, with the nitro drip, it's really easy to turn it off. Okay, so you do need uh, vented tubing, and um, the reason for the vented tubing is nitro is supplied in a glass bottle. And when you uh, have a fixed volume like Keith's Nalgene there, and you start drawing uh, liquid out of it, you create a vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. So you need some type of a vent. That's the same reason you're drinking that cup of coffee and it's got that little hole on the other side of your lip. And if it ever gets clogged up, then you can't get any more coffee out, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you need vented tubing. Um, if you don't have vented tubing, you can take the end of a blunt needle and you can stick it in there like you've got your drip set like you spiked into the regular thing and you can put a needle in the other side. It won't leak out the needle because that's the vent side. You're making a vent essentially and it'll, it'll equalize the pressure and the, the infusion will happen again. You'll know you have a clogged vent or you forgot to open the vent because the pump will say um, occlusion um, uh, bag side or, or um, medication side or something like that above the pump. It'll beep at you. It'll let you know. Okay. And one of the things to check for that is open the vent. Parker's got a whole blunt thing. That doesn't create a less than ideal sterile environment. Is that, that's not a problem, right? Maybe not sure. not ideal. Not ideal, you'd have a vented tubing. Right. right. Um, I'm just wondering if it is acceptable. A lot of times, a lot of times, what I do if I wind up with a weird vacuum or the vent got clogged for some reason is I'll I'll stick in, equalize the pressure, and then pull it back out. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just sitting in there That's constantly. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I have seen cases where people can't get things to flow and they'll just leave it open. Yes, technically you've you've left that non-sterile at that point. Um, but mostly that's a trick to equalize the pressure because once you create that vacuum, it's very hard to to fix. Um, you want low absorption tubing, and the reason for that is up to 52% of the drug gets hung up in the plastic of the tubing and then doesn't go into the patient. So you think you're giving the patient 10 mics and you're actually giving them five, okay? So low absorption tubing, and I did check, and the tubing that Messi has is low absorption. Um, low absorption tubing, typically, if you look at that picture, does not have a bunch of extra ports on it. It just has the one port, okay? So you can either run that direct to the IV, dedicated, dedicated line, or remember I said heparin and nitro are compatible. What you can do is take your low absorption tubing and put it on the port closest to the IV. That way the nitro is flowing through as little of the um, non-approved plastic as possible, okay? So uh, low absorption tubing is preferable, and um, you'll frequently see that it's like blue if you're transferring them from another hospital, sometimes green or it's a dark color. It's, it's often a little more rigid, okay? Um, and it's usually a 20 mil uh, per drop set, but that doesn't matter because you're gonna put it on a pump anyway. Questions about tubing? Cool. All right, so just for your comparison, 400 micrograms is what's in one of those pills that we administer all the time pre-hospitally, and that's absorbed over five minutes, okay? So that's the equivalent of 80 mics per minute of nitroglycerin, all right? So if you start the patient off at two or five mics per minute, worried that they've got, you know, like some relative contraindication or we're not sure how they're gonna tolerate this, you are giving such a pathetically small dose compared to one of those pills, and remember, People get prescribed these pills and take them at home with no EKG, no medical supervision, no paramedic to hold their airway open when they have a syncopal event, and it's considered safe, right? So I would submit to you that hanging a drip at five mics is pretty low risk compared to some of the other things that we do all the time and that they do without any of our help whatsoever. So I wouldn't be too concerned about it. All right, nitro paste. Uh, this is not an infusion, but just for your knowledge, uh, it is possible to give nitro by uh, um, topical as well. And one nice thing about that is if you have a limited number of IV access, then nitro paste could be a way to, um, to free up an IV. So it's ordered by length. So they're going to say put an inch of paste on, which is kind of an imprecise thing. I'll show you a picture in a second. And it's usually on the anterior chest. The picture I was able to find, it was on the shoulder, but it's gonna be somewhere, hopefully, pretty central. And it's nice because it doesn't need an IV. Don't touch it without a gloved hand because you'll feel a little funny. 
and uh, you want to wipe it off with a towel if you're not using it anymore. One of the big challenges here is what happens to heart patients? They sweat, right? So if you're sweating, you have variable absorption of the medication that's on the skin. And also, if your blood pressure is really low, hopefully they didn't give you any nitro, but if it gets low, uh, there's not going to be a lot of absorption because you're not perfusing your skin in some cases. So variable absorption rate. There's a picture of it. Um, so that's the paste on the bottom and the placard on the top. And you can see, like, you know, like when you're brushing your teeth, some people put just a little bit of toothpaste and some people put a big fat, you know, uh, amount on there. That's all the same inch, right? Uh, and then they put that on there and they'll put some tape on there to, to hold it in position. So if a patient has this and you're going to switch to IV, I would think, you know, at least be aware that it's on there. Um, and then once you get the IV started, you know, think about removing it just so you're not giving the same med twice. It's, yeah. It's worth noting, like, my grandmother had that at home. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I actually had a patient who had it all over her in Roman. Yeah. Um, and, like, it was, people were just going in there and starting to touch her to move her. And I was like, just don't. I mean, like, all over her, mm -hmm. all over the blanket. You should do that. <laughs> no, I've had the old lady whose husband didn't know exactly he was supposed to remove the fentanyl patch. Oh, and just stuck him out. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I can see it happening too. Okay, so here's another scenario. 62-year-old male presented with chest pain after mowing the lawn. Vitals are blood pressure 170 over 98, pulse of 98, respiration is 14, 95% on room air, and he's currently 0 out of 10 on pain. Okay, so we're good. Diagnosis is an end STEMI. He's been given 324 of aspirin. He got a heparin bolus. Don't worry, they got the right system. Uh, he got sublingual nitro times three, and then they hung a drip. Typically, after three sublingual nitros, we'll switch to a drip because it's really tedious sitting there and feeding the nitro every five minutes. So uh, he's on a drip at five. The plan is to admit him to a medical floor uh, for a cardiology consult. Questions about this patient? Pretty straightforward, huh? This is our bread and butter. I would argue that this is the number one patient that you might be called to uh, transport from Messi in this community. This guy doesn't need to fly. He looks pretty good. Um, he just needs to get a heart cath in 24 hours, and he's going to get sent to some place where they have a cath lab, which is probably not your critical access hospital, right? So, so history of this before? Um, no history previous. Okay. Yeah, he's been been pretty healthy. All right, so during transport, all these people get sick, right? Um, so during transport, he's complaining of 8 out of 10 pain, and it's radiating to the jaw. His blood pressure is now 190 over 110, pulse rate's 100, sats are 99% on room air. You increase the nitro to 20 mics, and he's down to 4 out of 10, and he says he's feeling a little better, but he's still uncomfortable. What do, what do you guys want to do? Another 12 lead. Okay, Jeff wants another 12 lead. That's good. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Good. What's that? Yep, you more than double. And why else are you calling back control? Change in patient condition. Change in patient condition. He's having pain now, which is the difference between needs to go to the cath lab and can chill out for 16 hours on the floor and not see a physician. Big difference, right? Okay. Um, anything anybody else wants to do? MS. Okay, a little morphine. Reasonable. Do I have a heparin drip I can hang? That's a great question, yeah. So um, if we had heparin, that would be a really good thing to talk to med control about initiating. Yep. Okay. And med control is probably going to call their friend the pharmacist to do the weight-based dosing for you because they don't know it off the top of their head. Just for heparin, if you're going to initiate, you know, are you going to start with the bolus every single time and then go? Okay. Yeah. Well, and he's the reason, the bolus. Yeah, he got the bolus. Yeah. yeah. So. He's probably not going to get a repeat bolus. Um, right. So that's a good point. Anybody that gets a bolus should be getting a drip, because otherwise you peak and then you go back down. Okay. Maybe that's why he's having pain. All right. So if you started the heparin drip, titrated the nitro up, and got another EKG, the patient now has a STEMI. They go directly to the cath lab, and they go home two days later because they're doing well. They don't have any heart failure. Okay. And one of the big things that they do when they review, every single STEMI gets reviewed by a team of cardiologists. And one of the things they look at is what is the outcome in terms of ejection fraction or heart failure, okay? Because that's one of the largest complications associated with a heart attack. Sure, you can have an arrhythmia in the first four hours and die, and you can have all these other complications, but 
one of the big things with a heart attack is becoming disabled because you, you don't have good squeeze anymore. And it's the difference between getting to go out and have a beautiful hike on a nice day like today and being bedridden, right? So, yeah, ejection fraction. So if you only titrated the nitro up to 40, then the patient's pain was about a one out of 10 and you didn't get taken seriously because it's just a one out of 10, right? So they go to the floor and they get their heart cath 24 hours later and now their ejection fraction is 30%. 65 or better is normal. So they're discharged on day 10 and they can't hike anymore or mow the lawn, okay? This is very real, right? People get heart failure because of delays and things like access to cath labs, right? And making him a one out of 10 is better than where he was, but it's still far from the definitive treatment, okay? So I thought anyone needed cath lab meant immediate. All the time, all the time, yeah. And and this is not unique to St. Pat's. This is not unique to Western Montana. Um, you know, community's cardiology team came over, I think about a year and a half ago, and they were gracious and gave us some great EKG training. And during one of the breaks, I went up to him and I said, hey, are you gonna cath somebody at three o'clock in the morning for, you know, if they're not having pain? And he shook his head and he said, no. And he said, you know, first of all, the literature says it's not as safe, right? Because doing things at three in the morning, people's performance is not what it could be. Yeah. Um, so there's a risk benefit. So he said, it's, it's just not safe. And the other thing is, he said, it burns out teams. You know, he said, people want to quit. And, you know, if you can do a cath at eight o'clock in the morning under more idealized conditions with a freshly rested crew, the argument goes that that's better. But the key difference is, are they continuing to have anginal symptoms? And so allowing somebody to kind of skate and say, oh, it's just a little pain, or they're so much better than they were, you know, um, it enables them to get ignored. And somebody who's having one out of 10 pain, and maybe nobody calls ahead to update us on that change, and they've already landed on the cardiac floor, you know, the, it's hard. There's already so much inertia, right, to just like, oh, he's fine, you know. Um, but he's not. Dave. Perks, do you ever bump up nitro based on, like, or chest pain, like other, other things that look like ACS are increasing. Like yeah, abso absolutely. So I kind of used a uh, more general term a minute ago, anginal pain or mm -hmm. anginal symptom. Yeah. Uh, remember that women don't present with classic chest pain. So women, it could be their shortness of breath. It could be their nausea. It could be their sweating. Um, those are much more common symptoms and in the female patient. Absolutely, because that, that represents ischemia in the female patient or atypical chest pain. I've had cases where you know the patient's only symptom was arm pain or jaw pain. Mm -hmm. um, I've had cases where people presented with like posterior neck pain. Those are very atypical symptoms, but absolutely that represents angina. So um, I had a guy that said my he passed out at dinner in front of his family and then said, my butt hurts, and this is what happened with my last MI. He was having wow. stemming, stemming. Yeah, and it's hard to take that guy seriously, but you know. It was, luckily he also like had all the other animal equivalents. He was horribly pale and diaphoretic and it was. Yeah, so signs of angina, definitely to treat with nitro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I worked with the captain at the Fire Department. He, when he would run, he would feel pain in one of his molars. And if he pressed his finger against it, it would go away. So he would run with his finger because he gets that molar. Finally went to a dentist, and I always say, what a smart dentist, because he saw there was nothing wrong there. And then he said, you need to go to a cardiologist. He ended up having like a quadruple bypass. But what a great example of anchoring, right? Because well, yeah. like you're a dentist and you're looking at a molar, you know? Yeah, no good. So to think about the heart, you know, that, that, like that takes, life. yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, discharge if you only titrated the nitro. And if you only repeated an EKG but you didn't call or you didn't do the EKG at all, then the patient went to the cath lab six hours later with 10 out of 10 pain. He declared eventually. And uh, now his EF is 50%. Okay. Um, so, you know, variable outcomes based on your actions during transport. Okay. And uh, the worst case scenario is the patient goes to the floor, nobody raises any red flags, and then they kind of smolder overnight and get into trouble, okay? So uh, three different outcomes for the same patient. And by the way, because he got, and Jeff picked up on this, he got the bolus but didn't get a drip, which is probably one of the reasons he decompensated during the transport, 
Okay, so he should have been put on a drip. So presence of pain defines whether the patient sees the doctor immediately, and it's really important to communicate that because if they're not having pain, and a lot of times, this is like one of the most classic failures to update, right? The sending facility calls the cardiologist and says, yeah, I got him on a nitro drip, he's doing fine. If that's the last they hear about it, then they're not coming in at two o'clock in the morning to see this patient because he's not having pain. And until somebody tells them otherwise, that's the story, all right? So repeat EKGs can give you a really important objective data point, and uh, when they do have that STEMI, it changes everything. Suddenly the hospital's on a clock. I would much prefer to have a STEMI rather than a non-STEMI. Survival rates for STEMIs are actually higher than non-STEMIs. And one of the theories about why that is is because STEMIs are on a clock and it's a reportable number and they really care, right? Non-STEMIs, well, I'll get to you when I get to you, you know? So uh, I would much prefer to have a STEMI personally. Um, just because it doesn't matter, even like right now, I would still get timely care. Um, but you do not want to check in, you know, at nighttime on a weekend. There's been lots of, you know, study after study shows that people's mortality rates are higher when they're admitted on weekends and at night. And that's one of the reasons, because they just don't get as prompt care. And unless somebody like yourself highlights the difference for them and really pushes to, to get the patient prompt attention, you know, we're all too happy to wait. So. And again, that's not without cause, you know, bringing somebody in at three o'clock in the morning, you know the incidence of mistakes is gonna be higher. So everything's a risk benefit. All right, and then how you present the case anchors the receiving nurse, all right? So if you tell the receiving nurse, yeah, they're doing a lot better. I mean, I'm really pleased with how they look. They, he looked way worse earlier. Then they're gonna be like, yeah, he's good, right? But if you come in and you say, hey, he is still having pain. I've increased this nitro three times higher than it was when I picked him up and he's still not a zero out of 10. That's a completely different statement. Both of which are true, right? But one of which is gonna cue that nurse into being like, yeah, we need to do something else about this versus, yeah, good, problem solved, right? All right, potassium. So potassium is administered via pump, must be administered via pump. This is a copy right out of the state protocol, copied and pasted. And the infusion rate may not exceed 10 milliequivalents per hour. So potassium is dosed in milliequivalents. That's the unit or the, the dosing um, amount. It's mixed in a fluid volume. Um, and if the potassium is mixed in less than a liter, then um, it cannot be more than 10 MEQs. Okay, so 10 MEQs per liter. Yeah. I guess this is kind of ridiculous to me because I don't think I've ever had anything with less than 20 K. Yeah. I mean, really, I don't think I've ever done a transfer from anywhere in the world that's got to be for blood that has less than 20 Now is the 20 K in a liter of fluid? You're okay. So it's only, what it's saying, and I'll show you pictures of it, if it's 100 milliliters, you, like the little bag, you can't have more than 10. Okay. So. They do, in the little bags, they make 10, 20, and 40. They don't want to see 20 or 40 in the little bag, okay? But if you have a one liter, you could have uh, up to 40 MEQs in that liter and be okay in the concentration. Yeah. Um, if the patient has no fluid restrictions, uh, they would prefer that it be in the liter, okay? So we'd much rather have it be in the liter bag because it's, it's gonna be safer for the patient. More diluted, uh, harder to mess up with your pump. Okay, um, but what they don't want to see is the 20 MEQs or the 40 MEQs in a 100 mil bag. It's kind of a big concern with this is cardiac arrest, right? Get too much. And one of them. Now we're working yeah, one, one of them. Yeah, there are others though. Um, so the potential benefits, and I'll get to the adverse effects. <laughs> um, so reduced myocardial irritability and decreasing ectopy. So if a patient comes in and they have a lot of uh, like AFib RBR or frequent PVCs, uh, maybe even runs a VTAC, um, then one of the things we check is their potassium and thinking that it's low. If the potassium is low, the myocardium becomes irritable and more prone to arrhythmia. So if they're tachycardic or ectopic, we wanna know what's the potassium and what's the magnesium. And frequently those labs co-occur. If their K is low, frequently their mag is low too. Um, so the other thing with potassium is it actually physiologically allows pacing to be effective. All right. So if uh, your K is not in a normal range, and this would be more common if the K was too high, 
then pacing cannot be effective. And so we want to make sure that we have the, have the potassium level optimized. So there is also some role for potassium in uh, coagulation and some other metabolic processes. So for a whole bunch of reasons, people like to have normal potassiums. Do you know the normal level? Yeah, it's three, 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 five, three five to five. To three five yeah. yeah. And you know, we routinely see people down to three without very much symptom. You go below three, and you start to clinically, you know, that's where you're going to have malaise. cardiac irritability, malaise, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and also, and I don't fully understand this, but it's not a linear decrease. So to get to 2.8 or something requires just massive losses of potassium. So dropping a little bit is easy, like you puked a few times. Dropping a lot is like a Herculean task. So um, there's, and I, it's not exponential. I think it's like logarithmic or something. But if you're way low, it's it's like super impressive. So, and then you need a ton of potassium to get back there. Yeah. Okay, so routes. Oral is the preferred route because it's safer, faster, and easier. So 40 MEQ tabs are the really common one, and we would give it with a light snack because it irritates the stomach a little bit. IV route is limited to 10 MEQs per hour. I will tell you that in rare cases where people are super unstable uh, and we have a central line, um, in the hospital setting, we'll give it up to 20 MEQs per hour because uh, we don't want to wait. Um, and some of these patients are NPO, so they can't take the pill, and we need to give like huge amounts of it, so we give it a little faster. But again, the state protocol, 10 MEQ, and that's also our protocol if we don't have a central line. So the IV route is limited to 10 MEQ, and it takes four hours to do the exact same thing as what one pill did, right? So that's why we prefer the pill. We'd rather just give a pill. We don't tie up an IV. We don't have to put them on a pump. It's just way easier. But sometimes people are NPO, right? So frequently, both routes are used. We'll give uh, 40 MEQ orally, and then we'll add uh, 10 on top of that, um, or 40 on top of that IV to correct hypokalemia. That might be a situation where we're not entirely sure the gut's still working. You know, they come in, they've got a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. That's how they got their low potassium in the first place. So we'll give them a potassium pill, but what's their absorption going to be if they have a GI disturbance? Yeah, it's variable, right? So we're going to give it in both forms, because if they got a really low potassium, we can afford to give 80 MEQs, and it's not going to hurt them. All right, so here's some pictures of some bags, and this is kind of what Jeff was alluding to. So the bag on the left is a one liter bag, and in red, it tells you how many MEQs of potassium are in there, and in this case, it's 10 MEQs. On the right, these are 100 mil bags, and you can see that there's three flavors. There's 10 MEQ, there's 20 MEQ, and there's 40. So as a paramedic, you're not going to infuse according to the state protocol, the 20 or the 40 out of the 100 mil bag, because that's too concentrated. We show up at the facility, they've got a 40 on there, we say, about you switch out for a 10? Yeah, uh, give, me, give me four 10s, um, which I know is kind of ridiculous. No, I just did this the other night. Yeah, yeah, give me four 10s, um, or, uh, or have, a, have pharmacy put this in a one liter bag. Those are your options. Yeah. And, you know, I would probably prefer the 410s personally, but whatever's faster. This is just a zoom up on the concentrations. Um, so you'll notice that the solution is different for these two. On the right, you've got uh, normal saline with 40 MEQs of potassium added. And on the left, you have D5 with just a whiff of saline and 10 MEQs of potassium added. Again, the potassium will always be in red. It's usually blocked out, super clear. And then it'll tell you what the solution is that they put the potassium into. Does the solution make a difference? Not to me, and probably not to yes. what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so scenario, 42-year-old female presented with five days of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. There's your classic hypokalemia patient. She's at an outside hospital one hour away. Vitals are a pulse of 105 over 55, pulse rate 62, respirations 14, SATs 99% on room air. She has a diagnosis of hypokalemia and dehydration. You already knew that, right? Interventions, she got 40 MEQs of PO of KDUR. That's just one of the brand names of potassium. And they've not yet started the IV route. So the plan is to go to the medical floor to admit to a hospitalist. During transport, you start the potassium infusion. Maybe they just they were trying to get that bag mixed for you because you know they didn't have it available in the ER, but it showed up just as you were leaving. 
So the nurse says, um, we don't have the right bag, but we've got no. a 40 MEQ bag. No. All right, good. Ah. good. Um, and all you have to do is program the pump for 25 mils an hour, and then you can just piggyback it into a two liter, right? We do this all the time. Sounds legit. Sounds legit, right? Um, nurses are funny because they'll always find a way, right? If you tell them to like, you know, administer something, then they'll jerry-rig it up, and it's like, eh, I don't know about that, but good, good effort. Um, so what's the problem here, right? You have way too much concentration for that dilutant, all right? Now, you know, yeah, so 10 MEQs per hour. So she's actually right. If you gave 25 mils an hour of that 100 mil bag, you're only giving 10 MEQs an hour, right? And if you plumbed it into a bag of saline that's running wide open, you're diluting it. So you could make the case, but is that is that what you want to roll into the receiving hospital with that <laughs> programmed up? No, nope. somebody's going to notice and somebody will be upset, okay? So uh, while that technically might actually meet the criteria, no, I would not want you to infuse that, okay? Because it violates the concentration. All right, so if you challenge the potassium drip, you got the right one from the 10 NEQ bag, and you did fine, the patient did fine. If you followed the nurse precisely, you broke the EMS <laughs> protocol, and the receiving facility wrote an incident report, and you were disciplined by your agency. But technically, you did actually, you know, you, you didn't harm the patient directly, although it was obviously not safe and not proper. And if you messed up the IV pump and you gave all 40 MEQs in one hour, which is why the state doesn't want you doing that, right? Because they're concerned that you're going to make a mistake. And, you know, how many of us have looked up at a bag of fluid and go, ooh, I didn't need to get that much, right? Yeah. That's all happened to us, right? So they don't want you to make that mistake with a 40 MEQ bag because that's, that's a bad thing. Um, so if that happened, then the patient reported burning in their arm and then developed bradycardia and phlebitis, and they had to have a surgical consult, and there's badness. So All right. If 3.55 is normal, yep. below 3 is bad, what on the high end would where it? Would it be like um, or at 6.5 or so, you'll start to see some bradycardias uh, and some EKG changes. At about 7, you'll see some more serious EKG changes. Okay. And uh, I'm just off the top of my head, at about 7.5 is where you start to see lethality. Uh, and again, different patients are going to act different ways. Sure. Um, but that's where you're going to start to see those, uh, those really wide uh, EKG complexes. Um, one antidote, and I would always call med control calcium. before doing this, is calcium, which you have on your truck. So um, if you somehow manage to over it. But again, like I was saying about like, it takes huge accumulations to get up to that point. So probably more than you have in the whole ambulance during the transport. So I wouldn't worry about making somebody who had a normal case suddenly have way too much. So, And if they have intact kidneys, they're going to fix that problem anyway. Um, I put this up not to teach you how to kill people, because that's, that's against our ethical code. <laughs> but I just wanted to illustrate to you that the three drug cocktail they currently use for lethal injections uh, in most states includes potassium. Yeah. So there's a benzodiazepine, to, it was uh, midazolam, to sedate people. And then there's vecuronium to paralyze the breathing, okay? And that's another drug we give for RSI, right? Um, and then there's potassium chloride to stop the heart, and that's the one I wanted you to focus on. So the reason that we're so anal retentive about keeping potassium on a pump is, yes, there's the risk that you can cause uh, yeah. stoppages of the heart, okay? So that's why we want to make sure that uh, potassium is always, always, always on a pump. This is a picture. I googled Ooh. potassium infiltrate, and oh, oh, this is a potassium infiltrate. Holy wow. This could absolutely happen with levofed. This could absolutely happen with any vasopressor, really. And calcium. And calcium, okay. Wow. Um, dextrose, this could absolutely happen. So next time you're hammering D50 into somebody in a little knuckle vein. Yeah. Um, <laughs> totally, right? I only do 18s, and they're only ever in the AC, right? Uh, so this was an infiltrate. And what it looks like happened here is a fasciotomy, because if you look, there's, this is actually the... Um, the uh, anterior and the posterior portion of the same arm, and what they've done is to open up the arm so that they can do a washout, and also to remove the pressure from the, the swelling. Uh, but this was probably 40 MEQ potassium that got infiltrated through a peripheral IV, is my oh guess. My okay, so 
So if that happens, we should do the fascia economy. Yeah. With, yeah. Preferably with a Leatherman. Or just, no. Or just pull over the side of the road and uh, exit your patient. Wow. Right. I never went on that just call. Walk off in the <laughs> yeah. yeah. Since, since this is being recorded, I, I don't want to premeditate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, now the official court document. <laughs> The, the point with this is uh, keep your concentrations low, check your IV lines to make sure they're good, and uh, recheck your lines. If you can dilute the potassium, that's why we want you to dilute the potassium. Uh, and then monitor for infiltrate. So, what, what kind of time frame are we talking to create something? Oh, this? This is probably a couple of days out. Yeah. I mean, you can see the bruising and stuff. This is. No, no, no I'm talking about back to the D50. You said D50 could do it. Yeah. So we push it in. You know, infiltrate. Yeah, um, I don't know precisely. It probably depends a lot on the patient, but D50 is just really caustic. Um, when the lawyer calls your call you'll know. ID, they know. Yeah, they know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so D50 specifically uh, is really hyperosmolar. Yeah. It's so hyperosmolar that if it was a continuous infusion, we wouldn't be allowed to give it in a peripheral IV because it's so um, dense. Yeah. And it's sucking fluid out of the, the rest of the body, right? It does cause damage to veins. And that's one of the arguments for using D5 in lieu of D50 um, okay. because of the concentration. And that's why in pediatric patients, they have you use uh, D10 or D25 yeah. um, instead of D50. Um, so yeah, just you know, make sure your line's good and then infuse the right concentration. My guess is the other thing that happened is this was probably an unresponsive patient, because in a responsive patient, they would have noticed that it was starting to burn like fire, and they would have ripped the IV out. But if you're unconscious and on a ventilator, then you know we may not be able to communicate with you. So I would bet that's one of the ways they got into this. Yeah. Um, one more funny story about that. When I was working in a different facility, uh, not anywhere near Missoula, uh, I came on shift, and we had this supposedly very experienced nurse. Um, who had been like an educator at a big trauma center. She's supposed to be a rock star. And I go in to see this patient. She's giving me bedside report, and the patient is writhing around in the bed and uh, really restless and saying that his arm burns. And I look up, and she's infusing potassium without a pump. And um, I said, oh, uh, you know, what's going on here? And she said, oh. Uh, yeah, you know, EMS started that IV, and I've been having nothing problems with it since, and I think they just did it wrong, and, you know, like, it's probably a bad IV. And I look, and you can see the drip, 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 so, like, it's, there's nothing wrong with the IV. But she's giving the potassium a lot faster because the line is positional. You know, in one position, it flows quickly, and in another position, it doesn't flow quickly at all, right? So she adjusted the roller clamp with it in one position, and then the patient would move their arm, and suddenly they're getting a bolus of potassium, right? So what symptom does the patient get? They get burning in the arm. Why do you not let potassium go free flow? Because of that, right? Because even if you're a rock star at adjusting roller clamps and you get it right, if there's a subtle change in the pressure, you know, resistance to flow, you have a different infusion rate all of a sudden, right? So this was like an old school nurse who, you know, thought that she could just get away with this. Well, it was totally unsafe, right? And uh, it's a good illustration of the risks of potassium, but also why we have to use the pump. Because probably when she walked away, it wasn't infusing at that fast rate, but by the time she got back, it sure was. And then, of course, you have to love the blaming of EMS. It must have been that, that paramedic that started the line. It's his fault, right? So, OK, how do we administer a drug that we've never seen before? Um, and those are two pictures of things that you've hopefully never seen before. So the first thing to do is look up standard dosing. It's great if you have an application on your phone. And Hippocrates is free um, and generally pretty well reviewed. There are other uh, reputable drug, drug apps available. Just make sure you look at a, a decent location. Don't be you know, just relying on Google, because not everything in Google is accurate. I know, I know. <laughs> So uh, look up the standard dosing and the infusion rate. Look up adverse reactions, OK? So no, like what's the worst thing that could happen with this drug, right? So we've already talked about the adverse reactions for these things. But like if it's vancomycin, look it up and realize that one of the adverse reactions is red man syndrome, which is flushing of the skin, all right? 
Look up the administration instructions. There's usually a specific section dedicated to IV, especially if you're using a reputable drug book. You want to discontinue infusions if you identify the adverse reactions. So you asked, like, is it in our scope to discontinue an infusion? Absolutely. That's why you're there. You're the professional that's administering this drug. So even if it's a drug you're not familiar with, if you encounter an adverse reaction, especially a serious one like bleeding, you know, for a heparin patient, it's your job to turn it off because you're taking responsibility for that medication. And I always ask people, like, if a nurse calls me and asks for their, in my opinion, about should I turn something off? I'm like, well, would you turn it on? Would you start that drug right now if, you know, if the patient had this symptom? No. Well, then turn it off. Right? Like, make a new decision every minute, right? Um, so discontinue infusions if there's adverse events uh, that are identified. Uh, Hippocrates is reasonable. The other thing is call med control or call pharmacy, especially if this is a drug you're not familiar with. Don't be afraid to call med control and say, hey, you know, I've never given Vanco before, but this guy's red head to toe, and I think it's red man syndrome, and I'm thinking about cutting the rate down. What do you think? Yeah, that's a great idea. Good. Now med control is involved, and they know, right? So um, don't be afraid to reach out to med control. So some quick pearls on antibiotics. Uh, Rosefin, which is very commonly given for both urosepsis and for pneumonia, um, or any urinary tract infection and pneumonia. Um, Rosefin is not compatible with LR. Okay, So Rosefin has to be given with normal saline. So if they've hung LR, you're going to have to switch the driver so that you can give your Rosefin. I'm sorry, we had that call. That's OK. Yeah. You just go yeah. through the LR and the NS, yeah. what goes Ro is an antibiotic that we use for uh, urinary infections and pulmonary infections. So it's one of the most common drugs you will give for sepsis. And rocephin is incompatible with LR, so you must give it with NS. Um, and typically it's going to come in a small bag and you're going to piggyback it into the, the main driver. Um, and it's just important to make sure that that main driver isn't full of, N of LR. So. Uh, vancomycin has a pH of 2.5. It's extremely acidic, right? Um, so you want to use a big IV, and if a rash develops, then you uh, cut the rate in half, and if that doesn't work, turn it off. Red man syndrome is more scary than it is dangerous. Um, report it. Think about anaphylaxis, but not all red man syndrome is anaphylaxis. So um, just because they're they're red doesn't mean that they, they necessarily need that be. Yeah. Well, the question would be, if would somebody be faulted if they turn it off? Well, if they tangle, they gave a little bit of mandrel, it's probably the worst thing. Right? It's not going to hurt anything. I just don't know that it's sleepy with redhead. Yeah. Red head. Um, I don't think Benadryl would help red man syndrome particularly, but no, I'm sure you wouldn't be faulted. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the treatment for red man is to turn the rate down. Uh, Zosin, which is also known as piperacillin and tazobactam. Um, has a lot of incompatibilities. Zosin is most frequently used for hospital-acquired pneumonia. That's another drug that you might very commonly give during interfacility transport, because if you're hauling somebody from a nursing home or somebody... Oh, no, 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 I got it. So if you're hauling somebody from a nursing home or if someone that's had any kind of exposure to uh, hospital bacteria in the last, I think it's 20 days or something like that, then um, they're going to be given Zosin instead of just Rosefin because the Zosin covers bacteria that are found in the hospital setting. If you have occasion to give Zosin, it is not compatible with almost anything else, so you're just going to give it in a dedicated line. A uh, banana bag is a multivitamin, thiamine, magnesium, just a whiff of magnesium, um, and folic acid in a 100 mil bag usually, or sometimes it's in, in a liter. And uh, the banana bag is for your ETOH population. This is yeah, go ahead. Um, banana bag is going to have very few side effects. It's just going to be administered at a controlled rate. Um, and there shouldn't be a lot of complications. But you'll see all these things printed on the bag, and you're like, oh, that's a lot of stuff. But it's just, they're very, it's basically a vitamin shot. Vasopressors um, suggest that the patient might need critical care transport. I'm not saying that it's outside your scope to transport somebody on a little bit of Levofed, 
but I am saying that that should cue you into the overall kind of patient that this is, and you should be asking, is this somebody I want to put in the back of an ambulance and be alone with for two hours? So that could be a long time. Um, and maybe the answer is yes. You know, maybe they've been stable for hours on a whiff of levofed. Cool. You know, uh, but if they're needing increasing doses, um, or if they just had a major trauma and haven't gotten their blood resuscitation, then uh, that makes me more concerned. Okay. So if vasopressors are being used, um, ask if the bolus has been completed. This is one of the biggest failures with vasopressors. Vasopressors are the squeeze, right? But you have to fill the tank first. If you don't fill the tank, if the, the, the circulating volume is too low, then squeezing the daylights out of them is not going to help. All right? And it may actually contribute to more ischemia and more um, metabolic demand. Okay, increased heart rate, increased burning up of oxygen, and shunting of blood away from the peripheral organs like the kidneys and the liver, the things that we really want to confuse. Okay? So if they're in a shock state and you haven't filled the tank yet, especially if that tank is low on hemoglobin because they've been bleeding, then um, you absolutely have to refill the tank before you add the vasopressor. Okay? So anytime you encounter somebody on a vasopressor, instantly your question is, is this person volume resuscitated? Okay. And in a trauma patient, remember that all hypotension is hypovolemia until proven otherwise. So you really, really need to know they've got adequate hemoglobin before you started squeezing with the vasopressor. All right. um, the repeat dose uh, for a bolus, or I'm sorry, the, the dose for uh, sepsis is what? 30 mils per kilo? Okay. So if they have heart failure, you might see that go down to 15 mils per kilo. And some providers, are pretty cautious and they'll, they'll go even under that, like 10 mils per kilo, uh, and then repeat as needed. But generally, your question needs to be, have they been volume resuscitated prior to adding the squeeze? Okay. Um, IV vitamin K is sometimes used for reversal of Coumadin. Uh, there are other drugs that do this better now, but uh, they might have vitamin K running in the bag uh, for a patient that, say, fell and hit their head and is on Coumadin. So uh, that might be something that, that you encounter. 